Number 598. 598. Brother Leonard's going to lead us in standing on the promises. And after that, Paul, would you mind wording our prayer for us, please? Standing on the promises of Christ our King, who eternally saves and saves glory in the highest heart will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises. turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. We're going to begin our study in verse 15. We're going to begin by reviewing verses 12 through 14. But uh, if you're visiting with us or perhaps you missed a week or two because of illness, let me sort of catch you up where we Larry, would you do me a favor? For some reason, it says the batteries are done. Uh, on top of my... Speak, maybe so everybody can hear me while he's getting that. That's chapter 3, uh, beginning the first part. Peter goes... To the temple along with uh, John at the hour of prayer, which is approximately three o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, they're going there for the benefit or for the purpose of uh, going to the hour of prayer. But when they get there, there's a man who's at the gate, beautiful, and uh, he's been lame from birth. And Peter responds to him along with John. He said, "Silver and gold have I none, but what I have." I'll give you, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Thank you, sir. Hopefully these are true. Thank you, sir. What's bad? I checked it this morning and the batteries look good, so I'm, I'm assuming that they must have gone down. But uh, anyway, uh, we're at Acts 3. And we're going to pick up with verse 12 because... Peter will begin his second sermon. His first sermon in Acts 2 was in relation to the people saying, what is this we're seeing and hearing? And he says, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So he's referring them back. And so now in Acts 3, he's healed this man and there are people who want to know what's going on. So let's pick up with verse 12. And uh, we'll uh, read through verse 14 and then we'll pick up uh, in earnest with verse 15. 
So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant to Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Now, um, reading this tells us a little bit about the response to Peter is don't look at us and say, look what you did. He said, no, no, it's not us. It was God, but it's that same God that raised Jesus from the dead. This almost parallels Acts chapter 2 when the apostles were speaking in tongues and the people were, you know, perplexed about this, you know, what's causing all this. Peter starts out and he begins to say, this is what God intended. But then he changed the subject to being about what God did through Jesus. And here he does exactly the same thing about what God did through Jesus. And in verse 15, he says, And have killed the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Now, I want you to notice the uh, irony of this. They have killed the prince of life. You just let that mull around in your mind a little bit. Uh, when I prepare the classes for here on Sunday morning, I try to go through, and I'll just look verse by verse, and then I'll, sometimes I'll, walking, I'll listen. And I'll try to listen for the big message. And then all of a sudden, something will just jump out at you. It's like, wow, have I missed that so many times? They've killed, they put to death the prince of life. But they could keep him killed. And that's what Peter said in the first sermon. He says, this Jesus whom you killed, God has raised up. It was not possible that death could hold him. And so he's trying to emphasize to them, God raised him from the dead of which we are witnesses. Now, when you look at that phrase, what is the significance of saying we're witnesses? We saw it firsthand. This is not a supposition. This is not looking at somebody else and saying, I heard them say this. We saw it ourselves. And Peter and John are in a unique position is because they were with Jesus not just most of the time, but they were here with him just about all the time. They were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were with him when he was betrayed. They were there at the foot of the cross. And you think about all that John said. He said, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Well, let's go to verse 16 now. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now, there's a word that's going to keep appearing throughout Luke's gospel or Luke's account here in his gospel account and now in his record of the Acts of the Apostles. He keeps talking about the name. What is the significance of a name? It defines you. Does your name have any meaning to somebody else? You say, well, I don't know where you're going with this. Well, if you give me your check and I sign my name to your check, what good is it? Absolutely none. What do you have to have in order to authorize the bank to release that money? Your signature. Does it matter whose name's on there? Absolutely it does. Does it matter that this is in the name of Jesus? Oh, that's really significant. Because as we're going to study when we get into chapter 4, 
by or in whose name have you done this? And Luke is going to put emphasis on that name, name, name. And he says, in his name. Whose name is that? That's Jesus' name. Through faith in his name. Whose faith are we talking about being involved in healing this man? That's, I think that's a really important note. Now, it can't be the man because he didn't know. It's got to be Peter and John's faith. You know, there's a lot of people who go along and say, well, I'd heal you, but you don't have enough faith for me to heal you. But in this case, whose faith was it that was capable of believing in Jesus that made this man whole? Peter, there's Peter and John in this case. It was their faith. So it was through the faith in his name has made this man strong. Now, notice he says, whom you see and know. Could it be, could they be mistaken? You know, uh, Someone, I saw there was a, a man uptown, and he was riding in a wheelchair. But now I see him up walking around. Well, are you sir? sure? Well, I don't know. I don't know him personally. I've just seen him a time or two. Well, does he look like somebody else? Well, he could. But that's not the case here. He is in their very presence. You remember? He kept holding on to the apostles. He's there. He's present. And that's really going to get significant in chapter 4. So he says, whom you see and you know. How do they know him so well? See him every day. You know, you go in that gate called Beautiful, right there he is. Yes, sir. Well, I would say that, uh, first of all, Jesus healed, and uh, that would have preceded this. But Jesus didn't heal everybody that was sick. And uh, if you will notice, the miracles in the New Testament are associated with events that allow people to know that Jesus is the Christ or to be able to know that the apostles are inspired of God. In other words, it introduces something. The miraculous is not there just for something as a show. It's there to teach a lesson. It's there to provide. And uh, he may have wondered, but now miracles were not common. You know, that, it wasn't so, every day that somebody would see somebody who had had a miracle performed upon them. Now, they had heard about Jesus, but they didn't see it. Not everybody had seen everything that was done. Well, let's look as we go further in this verse. We'd be astounded at that. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Brother Roger Cook, if, you know, he suffered with his, you know, difficulty all of his life. Well, if somebody had been able to, Roger, stand up. And I, I have a feeling Roger would be the one leaping and jumping. <laughs> Don't y'all think so? And uh, that would have been an, an amazing event. And I think people would have been thrilled for it. And, of course, that we're going to notice that, but... Peter, at this point, is preaching. This is in the middle of his sermon. He says, the faith which comes through him has given this perfect soundness. Now, that's telling you that this man didn't just get partially healed. He got completely healed. And he says, it was done in the presence of you all. It wasn't as if Peter had said, come here, let's, let's go back in this little room here and let me heal you a little bit, and then it comes out. Peter tells him, 
rise up and walk, grabs him by the right hand, picks him up, and strength comes to his ankles and to his feet, and this man stands up and walks. Yeah, perfect soundness. I mean, that's complete. Now, that's, you know, that's an amazing thing to have happened. Well, let's go, let's go on down to verses 17 and 18 because the issue comes up. It was in the name of Jesus that this man was made to walk. He says, yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance as did your, also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Now, going back to verse 16, he says, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance. What does that mean, that they did it in ignorance? They didn't know what they were doing. What did they think they were doing? They felt like they were upholding the Old Testament. But specifically with regards to Jesus, what did they think they were doing? Punishing a blasphemer. Uh, You know, if somebody come into our assembly, and we've had some that would like to have been a little more vocal. Had a gentleman visit us not too many weeks ago. Uh... He told me he wanted my class, and I told him he couldn't have it. Uh, I mean, that was on a Sunday morning. Uh, But what would happen if somebody comes in and does as Jesus did right before his crucifixion? It says he drove out the money changers and the people who sold doves. What if somebody came in here and physically said, I'm going to talk, and I'm going to tell you that I am the Savior, that I'm the Son of God, and that I'm Jesus. How do you think most of us would react? <laughs> Hopefully nobody would shoot him. But, uh, but how, most of us would say either he is mentally deranged, which is a very good possibility, or we think this person here is being, uh, they're wanting some kind of attention. And they, that's the way they viewed Jesus. And he said, you did it ignorantly. But now, folks, there's a problem with that. Can you be ignorant even though there's evidence out there? It, if you're driving down the road and you're doing 80 miles an hour in a 30-mile-an-hour zone and the police stops you and you said, I didn't see the signs or maybe the sign was not there, you know what their answer is going to be? Ignorance is no excuse. Yeah. Ignorance is not an excuse. Now, let's look at verses 17 and 18 together here. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets. Now, that's important there. If God foretold this and you didn't get it, whose fault is it? It's your fault. Let me ask you a question. We get to the day of judgment and uh, you're standing there before the Lord and the Lord said, now you weren't baptized. And you said, well, Lord, I didn't think I had to be. Well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking the question, how will that work? If it's in his word, you know, God said, this is what I want you to do. He said, this was foretold that the Christ would suffer. And, you know, in their minds, how could the Savior suffer? How could the Son of God suffer? Well, God knew that was going to happen in the beginning. See, they have fulfilled this in condemning him. He said he is thus fulfilled. Now, uh, let's go ahead and pick up now. Let me just uh, sort of go on a side track here for just a second. 
Remember in John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles? He said to them, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. You're searching the Scriptures. You're going through them. And he says, But they're what testify of me. Or if you think about the two men on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, verse 32, and it says, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn with us when he talked with us on the way and while he opened the Scriptures to us? In verse 45, And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. You have people who don't necessarily fully understand and they're ignorant. He said, these people here have been ignorant of who Jesus was and what he did. Well, guess what he's going to do in verse 19? In verse 37 of chapter 2, they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? We want to know what we need to do about this. If you become convinced now that Jesus is the Christ, that you put to death the Son of God, here's what he's going to say. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, someone says, what's he talking about there? What's that word repent mean? We talked about that a couple weeks ago in chapter 2. Okay. okay. It's, it's a mental change in the mind first. Uh, it means a change of mind that's going to result in a change of conduct. And uh, repentance is brought on by godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. It means that you look at yourself and you say, I don't think I'm doing the right thing. In fact, I'm sorry for what I've done. And it means that your mind changes about that. You think differently about it. But now he says to be converted, some say turn again. See if I can get all that in there. Uh, what's it talk about? Turn again. Be converted. If you're paralleling Acts 2.38 and Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, when is a person turned and converted? What? When does that take place? I mean, when is it that a person is taken from the world of sin and put into the kingdom of God? It's, it's where baptism is at. You cannot escape the significance of that here. And so he says, be converted. Now, if that is not enough, let me offer you some parallel passages. We're going to go to Acts chapter 9 and verse 35. Chapter 11 and verse 21, chapter 26 and verse 18, and chapter 26 and verse 20. So if you want to just sort of flip through there, we're going to notice how this word is used. And it said in verse 35 of Acts 9, So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Turn to the Lord. You see, repentance is a change of mind. Can a person repent and not yet be a Christian? Yes. Because chapter 2, verse 38 says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized. You go to Acts 11 and verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Acts 26, verse 18 He's talking about his mission. He says to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. 
And then one more, verse 20. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Uh, I'd suggest to you that if you look at this, this idea of being converted is, when, is that step where a person says, okay, I am committing now. I'm making a commitment to this. And... Uh, Baptism was that step where a person made a commitment. And, uh, you know, I, I've had people come to me and they said, you know, I believed in the Lord a long time ago, and I'm really sorry for it all I've done. And I know now is the time for me to make a commitment. Time for me to, to, to do what I need to do. That's what he's talking about here in Acts 3 and verse 19. He said that your sins may be blotted out. What does that mean? Forgiven. Just like in Acts 2, verse 38, repent and let everyone be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So your sins can be blotted out. Uh, it's hard to tell people today. I tried to use this illustration with some young people not long ago, and they thought I was crazy. How many of you remember liquid paper? If you were in college during the time I was in college and you made a mistake and you didn't want to type your paper all over again, you pull this little bottle of stuff called liquid paper out and you made a mistake, you blotted it out and it was covered up, it was, it was invisible. Well, that's the idea of your sins being blotted out. Then he said, so that seasons of refreshing may come. That's a sort of a difficult way to understand it, but I think he's talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit there, the miraculous events that was going to be taking place. Seasons are refreshing uh, from the presence of the Lord. So this is a perfect parallel, if you will, to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Now let's take with this. Go ahead. Absolutely. Okay, let's go to verse 20 and uh, verse 21. And that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the time of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began. Now, let's go back and notice what he says. He may send Jesus. Who is he? That's God, the Father. He may send Jesus. When is God going to send Jesus again? Second coming. First time he came to die and to establish the church. What's he coming back for the second time? To receive his own, those who've, uh, who, are, who will be his people. And so Jesus is now in heaven. You remember in Acts 1, he ascended back to the Father. And it says, Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before. He's not here now. But you take verse 21, whom heaven must receive until... There's a, there's a time limit here to the times of the restoration of all things. That's a really uh, challenging way to put it. And to the restoration, um, Luke's occupation was what? He, he was a physician, a doctor. And uh, it's interesting how often Luke uses medical terminology. And the word restoration, guess what you, that would indicate? Being cured, being healed. And uh, so he says until the restoration of the healing of all things, which he says was spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets. 
In other words, this is something they talked about as well. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for just a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and let's just take verses 24 through 28. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. And Paul says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till. Y'all see that word till? He has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. When God created this world, where was death? It didn't exist. God told Adam and Eve that the day that you eat of this tree, that of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. In Romans chapter 5, when Paul is telling the Romans, he said that death and sin entered the world. So if he's going to restore, he's going to heal all things, what is God going to have to heal? Death. That's the big, you know, the elephant in the room, if you will. That's the thing that's got to be conquered. And Jesus is going to stay in heaven until the restoration of all things, which he's spoken by the prophets, and that is going to be death. And then beginning with verse 27, going back to 1 Corinthians 15, for he has put all things under his feet, but when he has put all things under him, it is evident that he who put him, all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, the Son himself will also be subject to him, put all things under him, that God may be all in all." Paul said, you want to know when it's all going to be made right is when Jesus returns, and when Jesus returns, what's going to take place? Marvel not at this. All that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. When the Lord returns, Everybody's going to be raised. Every dead person is going to come out of their graves. That's when Jesus will come again. And that's what Luke is recording here of Peter's sermon. Now, he's talked about all of his holy prophets, all the things that they've said. So what he is going to do now, he is going to expand on that. And we're going to expand on it just a little bit as well. The first one will be Moses. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Now, that is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15, and then verses 18 and 19. You see, that was Moses saying, God's going to raise up another prophet. He's going to be like me in the sense that he is a lawgiver and he says, he will come from among your brethren and Jesus was from among the brethren, the Jewish people. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. Moses is trying to say, there's going to be another one coming after me. If Peter is preaching to Jews, do they know this? Sure. They were looking for the coming of the prophet. They didn't know everything about it, but there was many things more to be said. Now, here's where I could go off on a tangent, which I, I could spend a lot of time, but I'm not going to. But there's other prophets Second Samuel 7, verses 12 through 16. Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 4. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Those were prophecies of the coming of Christ, the coming of his kingdom, and how it would continue. Then you go to uh, verse 23. And it shall be that every soul who does not will not hear that prophet 
shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. Whether it was Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, they all spoke about the time of the coming of the church. What does that tell us about when we study these books of the prophets? I'm teaching Ezekiel on Wednesday night now. And there's a lot of focus we've looked on how that related to the people that um, he was speaking to. But what is behind all of this? The coming of the Savior, the coming of his kingdom. We've not yet got to Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, but when we get there, that's going to be a look at the church and a look of what's coming. And if you don't see that, you're missing a most important part of that. Now let's take verse 20. Oh, yeah. And it just, that's so ridiculous. You got 40 men over all these years having a very coherent book of men of different places and occupations. Verse 25. You are the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, if you go back to Genesis, to chapter 12, verse 3, to chapter 18, verse 18, to chapter 22, and uh, verse 18, in chapter 26 and verse 4, in chapter 28 and verse 14, guess what he tells him? It's your seed. The seed of Abraham is going to be the one who is going to bless all the families of the earth. And we could spend a whole lot of time going to uh, Galatians and talking about not to his seeds as many, but to one who is Christ. So all of this is focusing. Now, if you're a Jew and he's saying, you know what? Moses did write about that. Samuel did write about that. All the prophets wrote about that. And even that promise was made to Abraham. Jesus is simply fulfilling everything that the Old Testament said he would be. If you were going to study with a person who is of Jewish descent today, where would you want to start? Old Testament. Because you say, let's go look at these passages and talk about the ones that talk about the coming of Christ. Now, verse 26. To you first, God having raised up his servant, Jesus, sent him to you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. To you first. What does he mean by to you first? Jews first, Romans 1 and verse 16. And then it says, having raised up his servant Jesus, he raised him up, he sent him to you to bless you, turn you away from every one of you from your iniquities. God sent Jesus the first time here for the purpose of blessing people through his death, but it was also to turn people from their iniquities, to change people. Um, what is it that changes the lives of men and women, boys and girls? It's the gospel. When they recognize who he is, what he did, and the way he wants us to live, then I think that's very, very important to recognize. That's why you turn people away from their iniquities. You've got to preach the gospel to them. Well, I purposely am going into chapter 4, because the chapter division between chapters 3 and 4 does not exist. It's the same message. Peter's still preaching a sermon. And guess what's going to happen? Verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Now, the context is going to go through verse 4, but I've only got five minutes, so... I probably got five minutes of verse 1. So what we're going to do, we're going to dovetail 
the end of this class or the beginning of next week's class. Now, as they spoke, they interrupt Peter's sermon. Peter's preaching. He's trying to tell them all that the scriptures spoke about who Jesus was, the suffering that he was going to endure, and the offer of salvation which he was going to bring. But as they spoke to the people, in other words, there are people standing around. Where are they? They're on the temple. And they're in that colonnaded area around the edge of the temple outer court. There's three groups of people come. And there's some overlap between them. The first are the priests. The second one is the captain or the commander of the temple. And the third is the Sadducees. Now, um, the priest would be those who are carrying out the sacrifices. Now, uh, let's say, for instance, we had somebody come in here this morning, and the next thing we look, and there's about 25 or 30 people gathered in a corner. You think the rest of us would notice that? There's thousands of people now that have already obeyed the gospel. And we're going to notice in verse 4 that there's going to be now about 5,000 men. Is this a big crowd of people listening to Peter preach? Absolutely it is. Do you think that would capture the attention of the priest? They're carrying out their daily sacrifices. Yeah, and it's getting toward nighttime as well, by the way. And so what happens is they come, and the first of the priests, but the second is a specific person. He is the captain of the temple. What does that mean? He's sort of like the chief of police. The boss of the guard. The boss of the guard. <laughs> okay. Joe's referring to the Spanish translation, which indicates he's the boss of the guard. In other words, that's the idea. He's the, he's the, he's the head of these temple uh, officers. Do you remember when they came to arrest Jesus? It wasn't Roman officers they brought with them. It was officers from the chief priest, from the scribes, and from uh, here, the high priest. So this is the captain of the temple. He's the guy who's charged with keeping order. What if a rabble rouser comes in? There's a plan this morning. If a rabble rouser were to come into class here, there's a plan to take care of that. Not everybody needs to know that, but uh, there is a plan to take care of that. Well, this man was charged with that. The third group of people is probably the most significant, and that is the Sadducees. And what do you know about them guys? Well, let's go to Acts 23. 23, and let's go to verse 8. Um, Paul is going to appear before the Jewish Sanhedrin on that occasion. And uh, Paul is a pretty sharp dude. He knows the people. He knows their makeup. And he knows that in that audience that there are Pharisees and Sadducees. That's like saying there's Republicans and Democrats. And he knows that if you jump on one side, what's the other going to do? You know, if you jump on the other side, oh, yeah, we we'll, we'll better let him go. Look at verse 8. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Well, what did the Sadducees believe in? You're dead, you're gone. And so if you're going to be dead and gone, you better get everything you can get here in this life. They were the materialist. I mean, to them, it was all about power, control, money. Now, if they are preaching... Jesus raised from the dead, what's that going to do to us, as you see? Uh, hey, that's going to get them. And so the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. And the word came upon them means we're here to arrest you. We're, we're here to take you out, which is where we're going to start next week. 